Philip Soton. I am on the phone with Bill Weil from Climate Voice. Bill, thanks so much for joining us and taking the time out to chat today. Um, uh, it's let's, a pleasure. Glad thank to be you. here. Let's start with a little bit of an introduction. You've had a really interesting background. I wanted to explore first the kind of pre-Eureka moment stuff and then a little bit about the corporates that you supported um, after you kind of shifted into a more sustainability style of role. Sure. So yeah, um, just run me through. Yeah, so I started my career in computer science, actually in academia. I got a PhD in computer science and taught at MIT in Cambridge, Mass for 10 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Came out to the San Francisco Bay Area on sabbatical and stayed. Um, and then was in a couple of different companies over about, I guess it was a little over 10 years um, mm -hmm. that I was kind of in industry doing doing hardcore computer science, yep. you know, real technology. Um, and, you know, had the, the good fortune to work with lots of really smart people and, and focus on inventing, creating, doing new things. Um, and, um, but at the same time was watching what was going on in the world. I've kind of been an environmentalist, I think my whole life. My mother was an environmentalist. I mean, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. We composted, um, I mean, this is in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Nobody composted. Um, and, and we did, we recycled. Recycling was hard then. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I just grew up with the, the sort of ethos of, um, you know, you don't waste things, you take care of the earth. I grew up in an era when there was a lot of air and water pollution. So that was just mm. a very present concern. The air quality in Cincinnati in the summers was awful a lot of the time. Um, and, and so it just was something that, that I cared about, but it wasn't the field I went into. Yeah. Um, uh, and, but in early 2000s, I was just getting more and more worried about paying more attention to climate change, global warming, climate emergency, whatever, pick your favorite phrase these days. Yeah. Um, and um, so I decided to make a career shift. Bold, bold, bold and brave. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, honestly, I, could, I, I would say that was not something I learned growing up. My dad mm. had pretty much one job his entire life until he died. Most of his peers, my mother had, I mean, she volunteered. She had lots of unpaid work, um, right. but did not work for pay outside the home once she had kids. Um, most of my parents' peers had, you know, a job at a place. And, you know, that was, you know, a career at mm -hmm. one place. So just even leaving MIT and coming out here and then staying, I mean, sabbatical was, I think, understood in their world, but then deciding to, to not to go back was yeah. um, insanity Scary, um, and yeah. then changing fields. So I did not learn that. I mean, it, it, it was, it was scary, mm. but I give my wife actually a lot of the credit for inspiring me. She went back to school um, in 2001 to become a nurse practitioner and she'd been doing public policy work on low income women's and kids issues. And she decided mm. to go into you know, healthcare and direct service and went yeah. back to school. To do it. It's like, well, that's kind of a she big change. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. She can do it. I can do it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. it was inspiring. And I, yeah. And I think what's interesting there is, you know, two, two consecutive fears, fear of change and um, fear for the planet. And uh, right. Obviously, one was greater to overcome, great enough to overcome. Well, and I would other. say that that has been for me, honestly, the, the, there are lots of things I feel I'm not sure I know how to do. I'm afraid to try. Um, the fear of, well, if I don't, then, you know, mm. catastrophe might strike um, yeah. is a good motivator. It is uh, a motivator. Absolutely. So how did you make that change? And what was the, um, what was the first, first position post this yeah. career shift? Um, I didn't want to go back to school. I mean, I, I, already done one PhD that that seemed like enough. Um, I didn't have a burning desire to do that. <clears throat> so I wanted to find something where I could leverage my technical backgrounds or broad science and engineering background 
um, the business experience I'd had in the last several years at Akamai, the job I left at the end of 04, um, I had been chief technology officer. So I was on the technology side, but it was very much technology and business strategy mm -hmm. and partnerships yeah. and so on. So I got a lot of exposure to um, not just the technology side of the business, but how it fit in with yeah. lots of other things. See, see. Um, so, so I had, um, I think, a, a pretty broad base of experience, and I wanted to find something where I could leverage that and do something useful for the climate. Mm -hmm. um, and um, spent about a year on a on a walkabout, shall we say? Um, uh -huh. Uh, you know, uh, talking to people, networking, I probably talked to somewhere between, I didn't keep count, but sh I, I sort of wish I had between 100 and 200 people over the yeah. course of that year. Um, and um, basically getting advice on, you know, okay, I'm not a material scientist, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a mechanical engineer, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go design better wind turbines or solar panels or whatever. So I'm yeah. not going to do that kind of technology, but I understand engineering. I understand science. I understand a lot about business. Yeah. Um, what, what could I do? Um, and in the end I was lucky enough to land. I was in the right place at the right time. And I landed the job at Google. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, so this was early 06 when I started there. Um, they'd gone public a year and a half earlier. They'd started Google.org, which is their philanthropic arm. One of the three major, major pillars of Google.org was climate. Um, and on the Google.com side, they wanted somebody to figure out what the, the company, not the mm. foundation and philanthropic arm, could do about climate. Yeah. And okay. They hired me to figure that out. Yeah, um, cool. And they, that's a big role a for someone. Yeah, I that's a, a big role for someone with no experience in um, in this particular field. So they obviously right. they saw something and they saw saw some passion in it, and I guess it gelled with what they were trying to do at the time. Right, right. Okay, so talk me a little bit through that experience, and then I think from from Google you went to Facebook. How right. how is that whole thing in the um, in those very large companies, very large, you know, mainly online companies, how does how does that role work? Um, the big operational issue for both companies, um, especially at the beginning, was en energy consumption mm. in their own operations. Um, yeah. So, um, in both cases, they have big data centers. I mean, when I when I actually don't remember if Google, they must have had some least data center space when I joined, um, but they were building their own massive data centers. Um, Facebook, um, had, when I joined, had just built their first big data center, still had a fair mm -hmm. amount of lease space. So a lot of the energy consumption was in buildings they owned, some of it was, was leased facilities. Um, but all that energy, much of it was produced by burning coal or natural gas and, and um, that produces greenhouse gas emissions and other pollution. So that was the, the, the kind of burning issue, so to speak, um, uh, for both companies from a sustainability perspective and from a climate perspective. As they kept growing, there were other issues that, that, that began to be big enough to worry about, like waste and water and mm -hmm. materials in mm -hmm. the buildings and the servers and everything else, um, uh, and the supply chain. Mm. Uh, in both cases, I mean, they're, they are manufactured, both companies actually design hardware, their yeah. own servers that get manufactured for them by contract manufacturers, uh, mostly in, in Asia. And so they've got all the issues that electronics manufacturing supply chains have yeah. in terms of envir potential environmental issues, labor and human rights issues, and so on. So as their supply chain does the volume of the material they were manufacturing got large enough, those issues became big enough that, and, and we, as a company, were big enough and we had the resources to really start to pay attention to them. Yeah. Um, so in both cases, the role started pretty narrowly focused on, on energy, energy 
um, and associated climate impacts primarily, and then broadened from there. Um, at Google, we had a big focus on innovation and on trying to drive much more rapid innovation in clean energy technology. And this was partly because when I started, the goal was, well, let's be carbon neutral because that, that seems like the thing to do. This was 2006. Yeah. We, we, should, we should have zero impact on the climate. Let's figure out how to make that happen. We need to buy clean energy. Turned out clean energy back then was pretty expensive. Um, and there were all sorts of other structural issues around, in, especially in the U.S., in terms of the way energy markets work and are regulated that made it just difficult to, you couldn't just go to the corner store and say, I want to buy yeah. some wind energy. Um, and in regulated markets, you could buy from the local utility. That was it. Yeah. Uh, so, but the biggest obstacle back in 06 and for several years was it was just too expensive. It was two yeah. to four times more expensive than dirty Regular. energy. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we were profitable, quite profitable. We could have spent that money, but we wanted to do, to figure out how to do this in a way that would be replicable by other mm. companies. Yeah. And most companies can't just say, sure, we'll spend two or four times four as X. much yeah. energy. Yeah. Um, so we embarked on a program we called RE Less and C, which said for renewable electricity cheaper than coal. Okay. Um, and, um, uh, and we were naive and a little bit crazy, but it was basically the goal was not to just get to what people were calling grid parity, which meant, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, sort of same price. Same price as kind of the average price on the grid, but basically cheaper than the dirtiest, cheapest form of energy on the grid, okay. which was coal. Yeah. Um, and um, and to do that without subsidies for the clean energy and well without penalties for the yeah. dirty energy. That was the goal. Mm -hmm. um, this was back in 07 we launched that program. And we invested in a number of early stage startups doing new uh, innovative, risky technology on concentrating solar and enhanced geothermal and a few other things. Um, we had a team of scientists and engineers focused on uh, mostly on concentrating solar power with the goal mm -hmm. of driving the cost down rapidly. That was the goal of the overall program. Um, and um, we, I would say, were able to cut the cost of concentrating solar power by about a factor of two in two, two and a half years of work, which I think was, yeah, and we didn't end up building yeah. it commercially. So, um, uh, you know, I think you have to take all that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but I think we made some pretty significant advances. To get cheaper than coal, we needed a factor of four. So mm -hmm. we had another factor of two to go. Yeah, And we did not see how to do, do that without really, building a company and building the stuff at scale and and getting the the um cost improvements you get through learning by doing the, the yeah. sort of experience curve rights law and yeah. so on that um all the different ways economies of scale and other yeah. things that, that drive costs down as you scale um and so at that point we open sourced the, all of the designs we've done and everything we learned and and mm -hmm. moved on um, the world in the meantime was also, you know, a revolution was happening in um, solar and in wind, honestly. Mm -hmm. In both cases, the costs have come down dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah. Um, and in retrospect, that was quite predictable. Um, though, um, it basically, a lot of it was driven by increasing scale in those sectors that has driven by, driven economies of scale, learning by doing, um, the, the fact that they have enough revenue and profit to invest in R&D yeah. across the entire value chain from yeah. basic uh, solar cell technology to yeah. manufacturing to the mounting systems, racking systems they use to put on your roof or in a field and so on. Mm -hmm. Everything that is basically you know shaving costs out across yeah. the whole system. Um, solar is now 
six to 10 times cheaper than it was 15 wow. years ago. Which yeah. Is two or three times cheaper at least yeah. than it was then. Um, and both are cheaper than just about any f other form of electricity yeah. on the planet. Yeah, yeah, um, which is a huge success, isn't it? It's huge. It's, I mean, we, you know, when we launched RE Lesson C, people said, you guys are crazy. You don't know what you're yeah, talking about. They were right. Happen. We didn't entirely know what we were talking about, but sometimes that's how you make That's okay. Progress. That's how you get stuff started, um, yeah. I think, you know, the, the one of the things having been at MIT and in Silicon Valley, um, you know, you don't want to be stupid, but no. being a little bit naive and aiming yeah. really high usually yeah. gets somewhere much more useful and interesting than when you aim low. Yeah. Um, and it's so, that have a go, have a go approach, learn what you do, right. you know, learn to steer the plane while you're flying it kind of right. thing. It, you know, it, it um, can work. So, so now, and as of a few years ago, basically, it, it became cost effective for companies to buy clean energy. Mm. Um, okay. And when I moved to Facebook at that point, I think we had done either one or two large wind purchases at Google um, by the time I left, because it took several years for the cost to come down enough that we could yeah. find a wind project somewhere that was cheap enough. Mm. Um, I moved to Facebook and we started to focus on the other obstacles to buying clean energy. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that in, a, uh, in the US, in a state where the electricity market's regulated, you can't. You buy your electricity from the utility, they sell you yeah. what they have, which is yeah. whatever their the, grid mix is. Or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, it's some mix. Um, they'll sell you clean energy credits, renewable energy credits, or you know, in the U.S. they're called renewable energy credits. Different things in other countries. Um, uh, that'll cost you extra, mm -hmm. and it gives you the right to claim that you're using clean energy. Yeah, it might or might not mean that any additional clean energy ended up on the grid. And so we started looking at, and this we've done some of this at Google, but at Facebook we started looking at, well, how how can we get either work with these utilities or go around them yeah. to um, buy clean energy in a way that doesn't cost extra, that actually adds new clean energy to the grid. Mm -hmm. um, so we're having real impact. We're not just buying a marketing claim. And, and how can we get this to scale, not just in our own operations, but much more broadly. Mm -hmm. So we, we were part of a, what ultimately has become a very large group of companies, but we were one of the, the founding companies and really helped drive it, that, that created the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, okay. um, which now has 200 plus companies all working together to share best practices, to um, change policies so that where the regulatory structure makes it hard to buy clean energy can change the policy yeah. so it's easy and so on. Um, so basically, I'd say, it, you know, at both places, we were looking at um, the question of we, we, we want to clean up our operations. Yeah, yeah. There so are you want to be an example. Not. Yeah. So, right. We want to set an example and we want one to do our part. Hmm. Um, but there were obstacles that we needed to go um, yeah. solve. And yeah. the obstacles, I'd say, in, the, in that most of the time at Google were more about technology. At Facebook, yeah. it was more about regulatory issues yeah regulation and just switching gear a bit you mentioned um obviously energy a key part of it but you also mentioned the uh, manufacturing and supply chain footprint what what kind of work was being done there and did that did that drive results did that have an impact or is that in an earlier stage um that was i'd say earlier stage and mm -hmm. uh at least for I mean, I think those companies have continued the work since I left, and, and it's more advanced now. Um, and also, um, it, at the same time, it, there were plenty of other companies that were manufacturing electronics, all the major computer manufacturers, mm. the folks who make TVs and monitors and other consumer electronics and so on, who'd been dealing with these kinds of issues for 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah. So it was not as as new a space it's also um it was also not a just a technology issue certainly when no. we started working on the clean energy stuff at google the major barrier was technology yeah. that we were facing. yeah 
Um, but it was really about um, the systems involved in um, you know different cultures, different legal systems, yeah. and dealing with manufacturers in other countries, different labor standards, how to reconcile yeah. labor standards in one place with another place, and how to really have an influence on suppliers yeah. um, to get them if they're if they're labor practices aren't good or their environmental practices aren't good to get them to actually step up and, and yeah. do better. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. And the tool you have there is buying power, I guess, largely, um, you know, yeah, obviously pressure power. as well. And when we, buying in when we started our buying power was not that great because our volume was not that great. Yeah. And over time, as we kept growing, then we had more, more, leverage. more influence. Yeah. Yeah, and then there are obviously other large consumer electronics brands that, that are much more hardware dominant and they have more influence. Were there consortia there? Were there active yes. groups that you could take part in that really yeah, wanted Yeah, so their, there was a group their... called the EICC, the Electronics Industry Coordinating Council, I think, and they've since yeah. been renamed, I think, the Responsible Business Alliance or something like that. Okay. But, so there were... Um, uh, industry groups uh, mm. where a company that all had the same problem with they yeah. needed to work with and their the suppliers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we got involved with those and worked with those. Um, okay. Yeah. So fast forward to where we are now and I'm going to catch up with, um, with the, with the net, with the current part of your career as we go through this, but um, COVID-19, Big challenge for everybody, big challenge for manufacturing, big cha challenge for supply chains. One of the things that kind of broke on the news is very early was, hey, look, there's some good news. NASA's taking pictures and there's less pollution over China because all the factories are closed. Um, do we feel really two questions? Has there been a sustainability or climate dividend? And are there lessons learned? Um, I really don't like the people who say there's a silver lining, the air is cleaner. Mm. These people are dying. Uh, yeah. Um, and yes, the air is cleaner. I think the, the, the only way in which I, I would say that is good is that it has shown people who've never seen air that clean yeah. or water that clean, that we could make choices that would give us a very yeah. different world. Yeah. Um, uh, we're already seeing um, uh, emissions going back up as the lockdowns start to ease in various places. I just saw an article today um, about how emissions, um, and this was particularly focused on greenhouse gas emissions, um, that emissions have been, you know, they, they dropped a lot and they're now going back up and you can look at it by region, depending on how, you know, how, when the lockdowns, in you know, in China, started to ease up, and then emissions at China yeah. in China, I think, are basically about back to where they were pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and in other countries like the U.S., they're still down a fair amount, but they're yeah. up from their their trough, they're, right? Their trough. So, um, you know, it is. Some people say, "Oh, this shows we can reduce emissions." Well, I mean, to some extent, yeah. like we didn't need to do this awful experiment of having a pandemic to know that if we shut down the economy, emissions would go down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, we can reduce emissions. That's never been in doubt. Yeah. Um, the question is, what will it take to do that in a way that is sustained? And yeah. so I think the, the silver lining is maybe this shows people that there are choices we can make, yeah. but it's choices we have to make. It's not about everyone stay home and stop driving yeah. and stop flying. It's about let's do what we need to do, what we want to do, um, that helps us prosper and live good, fulfilling lives. Let's do it in a way that doesn't treat the atmosphere as an open sewer, um, mm -hmm. and that helps preserve a livable climate for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and to me, that's the that's the dividend maybe from COVID, um, yeah. if there is one, which is that yeah. um, it shows people what is possible with a different mm -hmm. set of choices. But it's yeah. not choices that mean st stop the economy. Because in no. fact, emissions, they've dropped. They haven't dropped actually as much as you might have thought. Like no one's driving. Why is that? You know, but, but in fact, 
um, you know, Amazon and others are still delivering lots of stuff to us. You yeah. know, cargo is yeah. still moving. Um, yeah. Ocean and air freight is still happening. Yeah. Uh, trucks are still driving around uh, with stuff. Um, and so, and lots of other things are happening. Some factories, many factories yeah. are still going. Yeah. Um, and all that produces emissions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, well, and so... Yeah. Here, twenty, we're we're like a twenty percent increase in energy usage at home. So, you know, energy right. might have gone down in the places that we would normally go to during the day, but we've actually cranked right. it. You know, we're when we're all else. We're, that's right. Our yeah, are well, in my house more often, yeah. right? You know, I'm we're potentially all heating a home instead of heating a heating a shared space, and that kind of brings me to my next point, which is this, um, you know, post pandemic. Um, if we've learned something, how do we, as you put, build back better? How do we do that? And when we look at things like, okay, well, you know, maybe we've realized that offices aren't such a necessity. How do we then make sure we're doing the right thing and we're not actually pushing everybody home and asking them to heat their house all day and, you know, they're not sharing bills, so they're using more energy. How do we, how, how do we build back better? Tough question. Um. <laughs> Right. Well, I think you could separate that into how do we, you know, if the pandemic hadn't happened and we weren't having to rebuild, mm -hmm. um, how could we build a better world and, and a world that is zero carbon, cleaner air, cleaner water, etc. cetera? Mm -hmm. um, I'd say what the pandemic gives us is an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, it's not that suddenly all the, you know, many buildings have been destroyed and we need to rebuild them. And when we talk about building back or rebuilding, um, it's about building back the economy. Restarting, yeah. The, and the question is, um, it, it gives us an opportunity. Governments around the world are spending trillions of dollars, euros, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, it's our money, it's public money, right, that mm -hmm. is being spent to keep businesses and individuals afloat to to keep the economy from turning into a you know horrific great depression again yeah. um, uh, and as we spend that public money we have a choice of how to spend it we have many choices you know millions yeah. of choices honestly um, and we could choose to spend it basically to bolster and support the economy as it's been and to um, help the fossil fuel companies um, basically stay alive and keep doing what they've been doing. And in fact, if we're going to invest in infrastructure, we could invest in more oil and gas pipelines and more infrastructure that helps grow the fossil fuel economy. Yeah. Or we could invest it in things that will um, lead to a much cleaner, lower, ultimately zero carbon economy. We could yeah. lay the foundation for the the decarbonization pathway we need to be on mm -hmm. um, and i think the fear a lot of us have is that if we simply take um this situation and treat it as it's a pandemic and an economic emergency and we need to invest money public money mm -hmm. to prevent catastrophe on that front and we basically apply the tourniquet and stop the bleeding uniformly across the economy um, and then start to rebuild, you know, inject money into various places to create jobs and create infrastructure um, without regard to what does that mean for the long-term future? The other catastrophe. We'll be spending yeah. lots of money on things that will basically be stranded assets and that will, mm -hmm. but at the same time, will lock in a high carbon pathway for many years to come. Yeah. So building back better to me means um, uh, if we're going to support companies that are high emitters, let's put conditions on the support we give them yeah. so that they are forced to, required to begin to shift rapidly onto a much lower emissions pathway. Yeah. Yeah. And that okay. we invest, in, invest that public money in things like wind and solar and transmission yeah. and batteries and grid modernization to provide more flexibility for yeah. um, uh, intermittent resources yeah, and, and create jobs. Um, electric vehicle infrastructure and yeah. um, uh, you 
know, various things where government spending or incentives could accelerate the transformation that we need to make yeah. from high emitting technologies to low or zero so emitting much technologies. Lower. Yeah. Okay. And then when I, when I look at that specific in the, specifically in the field of manufacturing and supply chain, um, if you're a ma managing director or a CEO or a CTO or a sustainability czar at one of these very large uh, contract manufacturing companies, what can you be doing to build back better? And bear in mind, they've got pressure on them from various different avenues to adjust their supply chain for less uh, more resilient so they're looking at more of a just-in-case policy instead of a just-in-time policy they're having to consider sentiment in the market as to where where their stuff's made what can what can they actually be doing what should they be doing um it is interesting you know the the supply chains that we built in the last 20 30 40 years the, mm. the we have become as a society masters at wringing out inefficiencies at, at rooting out inefficiencies and making things super efficient and i think yeah. the pandemic it, it in part has exposed how um as you said it we, we missed the just in case we've lost yeah. the resilience yeah um and um i think that 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 is something that's important for people to think about and and it's going to be interesting to see if there's always the danger that some competitor will decide, well, I'm going to just make things way more efficient and be able to make things at lower cost mm -hmm. and undercut you in the market. Um, and you might be more resilient, but if there's no major event that where that resilience matters in the next five yeah. years, you'll be out of business. Yeah. And so there is almost a race to the bottom that, that yeah. there are competitive structures uh, push that may mean that we need public policy or some kind of voluntary joint mm -hmm. agreement among companies to ensure adequate resilience. Um, but I think that um, you're right that that you know the procurement officers, the people who work with supply chains for manufacturing and so on, they have a lot of concerns that, yeah. that come into play. Um, and the one that everyone understands is money. Yeah. What's it going to cost? Um, and, and, you know, then what can I sell it for? Um, yeah. So what's my profit going to be? Yeah. Um, uh, I think that what the pandemic has shown is that you, there, there are risks that people weren't yeah. paying enough attention to that you need to pay attention to. I think climate is another one of those risks mm. that already we've seen in some parts of the world. I mean, Australia with the wildfires of the last, yep. um, this past season, California, the last several years yeah. with fires. It's yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's not, you know, we used to think five, 10 years ago, climate is a remote uh, yeah. concern. It's Danger. distant yeah. for me here in California. It's just in time. Um, uh, and maybe it's an issue in some parts of the world today, but that's far away. It's not my yeah. concern. Um, I think for more and more people, it's a concern it's clear here and, and now. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and it's a systemic issue, much like the mm. pandemic. It's not just, yeah. that, oh, my workers might get sick. The whole yeah. economy might shut yeah. down. Yeah. My supply chain might shut down. Yeah. My customers might stop buying. Right? Yeah. And, and I think that, that this is where I think people need to understand that the way one addresses systemic mm. risk is not just through individual action. Yeah. It's through... Yeah collective through process decisions and, yeah and that's yeah. where public policy comes in yeah um and so i think in uh, there there's kind of two two ways i would come at that if i you know one is what needs to happen the other is what's the motivation for a company to yeah. actually do it today? yeah and i think part of what needs to happen is we need companies to take the steps in their own operations that when most people think about corporate sustainability and, and particularly on climate, they think about setting a science-based target for your operations, maybe for your suppliers, buying clean energy, investing in energy efficiency, 
um, clean, if you've got a fleet of vehicles, cleaning yeah. up your, your fleet or, or the transport you use to move your goods around. Um, all that's important and needs to continue. Yeah. Um, but we also need public policy that will drive those changes across the entire economy much yeah. faster than they're happening with yeah. that individual action by you and me and individual yeah. companies. Yeah. Um, and for that public policy to happen in the US, in Australia, in parts of Europe, in other parts of the world, those who have influence over public policy and are committed to, to, to climate action need to actually step up and yeah. support the policies we need. Yeah. And mostly that's not happening today. It's beginning to yeah. happen some in some places. It's not happening enough. No. And the fossil fuel companies, um, which mostly are trying to, you know, some of them certainly acknowledge climate and, and, and um, you know, that we need to do things. The measures that they have been willing to support in terms of public policy to date have been pretty modest. Hmm. And they, they, and partly because I think the measures we need mean that their business is, business is yeah. going to decrease. Yeah. And they need to shift their business to other forms of energy or something else rapidly. Yeah. I think they're stuck. I don't think they know how to do that. No. So um, that maneuver. So they, cool. they use their influence. Um, in a big way all the time everywhere to delay or stop yeah. progress on climate yeah um, the status and, quo is where they benefit yeah right and and we need other powerful players major yeah. companies to step up on the other side in favor yeah. of climate action in favor of the policies we need um, or we're not going to move fast enough and so yeah. big companies that have big supply chains need to not just clean up their own operations, they need to stand up as champions for the yeah. policies that will clean up the whole every supply place chain, tier by tier. Yeah, what I'm really interested and, in and that The is, reason for that, yeah. uh, just you, you, so, so, you know, and, and why should they? Well, A, the world needs it. Mm. B, um, increasingly their customers are going to expect yeah. it. Yeah. And C, even, more quickly, I think, and this is part of what we're trying to do with Climate Voice, which is the initiative I started three months ago, mm -hmm. um, increasingly their workforce is going to expect it. Yeah. Both yeah. their current employees, and, but I think even more rapidly, future employees, the, the current, you know, the students who, the, who are in school today, who yeah. they want to hire next year, or the year after, yeah. are going to want to work for a company that really is all in on climate, that is committed across the board and everything it does, yeah. including using its political influence yeah. to work yeah. on. Yeah, and if they have to compete for those uh, members of staff, that becomes even more critical. Before we get on to Climate Voice, because I do want to talk about that, I just wanted to touch on motivation when I look at it from a supply chain point of view. And we've had this discussion, not with respect to sustainability, but also with respect to resilience. What the um, what we found is generally supply chain managers aren't rewarded for having the most resilient supply chain. They're not rewarded for buying insurance when that insurance has never been called in. They're rewarded for taking two points a quarter off of their complete bill of materials. Is that the case with respect to sustainability? And in the two companies that you worked with, which did have a very sustainable vision, were they encouraging and rewarding and having KPIs that related to sustainability? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I and my team, certainly all of our goals were related to sustainability, but up the management chain, mm. um, you know, those goals matter. You know, we set very aggressive goals on clean energy very early yeah. in, at each company. Um, and but what about the procurement guys? Um, that took time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that that um, part of it was we had to convince them that it might cost a little more money, but not a lot. Yeah. But that it was important, and we had to make the case for why it was important. So mm -hmm. it would matter. You know, that it mattered to uh, the employees. It mattered to our customers or users. And the brand. Um, and, yeah. 
Right. So I think that, and to investors potentially. So I think that that um, in the end, this is why um, you know I think companies, some companies will do this stuff purely out of the goodness of their heart. But in the end, they are they all operate in a capitalist environment. Yeah. Where they are judged based on the bottom line, well, the financial yeah. bottom line. Yeah. And if you're going to do something that has a significant negative impact on the financial bottom line, there better be some other really strong positive reason for doing it. Yeah. It ultimately translates into finances, honestly. Yeah. So yeah. if that means reputation that affects sales. Yeah. That um, hits the bottom or line. That hits the bottom line. If it means that investors start to bail on your stock, um, well, it may not hit your your revenue, but it starts to hit stock performance, which is going yeah. to affect perception. Yeah. It'll affect, yeah. you know, for companies that give stock options, it affects and the C suites bonuses. Higher. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, so in the end, I think I mean it's it's I I think this is uh, honestly a problem with our current model of how companies operate, certainly in the yeah. U.S., but I'm not sure that it's that different uh, in most, most other countries. No. Um, that the thing that people learn how to think about in business school and then in business is finance. Yeah, it's the stock and, price and it's the quarterly bottom line, isn't it? That quarterly right. earnings call. And, and so every major decision, you know, everybody in a company has, you know, they've got a budget, they've got a mm. headcount, you know, and people budget, they've got a, a financial budget, you can spend so many dollars this quarter, we're expecting you to generate so much revenue. Yeah. Um, so they're always asking the question, what's the cost? What's the benefit? Yeah. And most of that's about the financial costs and benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and okay. I think we need to, you know, you hear more and more Shift, businesses these days talking about purpose um, and, and stakeholder um, value, stakeholder yeah. capitalism as opposed to shareholder value. Um, I don't think most businesses uh, know how to think about that in a way that when there's a hard decision to make, yeah. it won't be basically the financial concerns that will win. Yeah, the wins. Yeah. And I think that's a big problem because they, you know, you talk about the business's bottom line as being the thing they're most concerned about, but no amount of money on their bottom line is going to help if the planet's bottom line is is severely negative. Right. So that's where the impact, um, you know, really ends up. Let's wrap up by talking a little bit about what you're doing with Climate Voice and where people can get the kind of resources they need to to help them build back better and um, create something yeah. that is more sustainable and how they can get involved. Well, so with Climate Voice, um, back to the, the, that discussion about the, the financial bottom line versus the planet's bottom mm. line. Um, at a high level, you can think about what we're asking companies to do, what we want them to do, and, and what we are trying to, to marshal and amplify the voices of many people to tell companies, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, is to, as we put it, go all in on climate. And what that means is every major decision they make or every decision should be evaluated based on the climate bottom line, the planet's yeah. bottom line, its impact on the climate, not just on its financial bottom line. Financial bottom line matters. Of course, companies, are they will never stop worrying about that. And yeah. they have to. You can't stay in business if you lose money no. um, you know, every quarter. Um, but you also, as you said, you can't stay in business if the planet ends up being unlivable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's not next quarter. That's several years away. This is where we need to make collective decisions yeah. um, to, to change that. Um, so, but the kinds of decisions companies make are um, they build buildings, they build factories, they, they buy energy, they mm -hmm. buy fleets of vehicles or or outsource things to other companies that make those same decisions. Um, so they should be evaluating every one of those decisions based on its impact on the climate. That's what we've seen over the last decade. Now there are hundreds, if not thousands of companies looking at their internal operations from yeah. that perspective. That's what science-based targets are about um, and you know, RE100, other initiatives. 
Um, we need them to also use that same lens about what's the impact on the climate with everything else they do. So they sell their products and their products are used by customers. What are they used for? Yeah. Google about, I think it's now three weeks ago, so early June, announced um, that they would no longer be selling custom AI machine learning solutions to oil and gas companies right. for oil exploration. So there's been, uh, there's been a series of kind of new cycles mm -hmm. over the last year, year and a half about particularly Google, Amazon, and Microsoft having significant business units devoted to selling AI technology. Yeah. And not just saying we have the technology, you can use it, but we will devote a team of engineers to building yeah. a custom solution. Yeah. Um, and most of that is aimed at making their operations more efficient and doing seismic modeling and yeah. other ways, helping them Better get expert. more oil and yeah. gas out of the ground more cheaply, more quickly, more reliably. That is not consistent with us reducing emissions, which yeah. is what we need to do. And Google, a few weeks ago, decided, um, and I don't know the details of their internal deliberations, but I do know there was a lot of pushback from employees about it. There was some pushback in the press. And I think in the end, they have an AI ethics board. And my, yeah. I, I think this question went to them. And the ethics board said, this is not consistent with the yeah. ethical positions we've taken on climate and other things. Yeah. And That's so good. they're going to stop. Yeah. They're leaving revenue on the table. Yeah. Because so it's bad for their bottom line in the yeah. short term. Yeah. Um, but because they felt it was otherwise really bad for the planet's bottom line. Yeah. We need more companies. We need every company yeah. to be willing to do to that those and decisions. think about each decision in that process. Yeah. Right. And, and then the I other major thing is on the public public policy front, um, uh -huh. where um, every company has a voice and has influence. You know, yeah. City where it's operate where it operates, yeah. the province or state, the country. The country. Um, yeah. And we need public policy. Um, yeah. We can debate what those policies should be, but we absolutely need much better public policies than we have today. Um, and when companies stay on the sidelines and are silent on an issue yeah. like climate, they allow the very powerful people who are trying to preserve yeah. the status quo to dominate the debate. Yeah. And that needs to stop. They need to step up. Yeah. Yeah. One of the groups that you seem to be doing an interesting job mobilizing is these students, potential employees, you know, actually getting the grassroots, the staff to actually put pressure on the company. Is that something that you've been very deliberate in doing? Yeah. So that's, so our, our model for change is, um, it, you know, we want to take this, what, people think of as long-term, far away problem of climate and, and turn their inaction on climate or their silence on climate policy into a near-term problem for their company. Yeah. And, and if they act, we want to turn that into a real advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are organizing, mobilizing, amplifying the voices of students in their role as future employees and of employees and and we're three months old so we're just getting started but we've got you know hundreds i think maybe now thousands of of people who signed our pledge basically saying i want my employer to be all in on climate uh -huh. to be a strong consistent advocate for climate policy everywhere they operate um, and that will be a big factor in my choice of where to work yeah either if i'm a student looking for a job or i'm a current employee but it's something that I'm going to care about. Yeah. And we've seen in other um, public policy issues, certainly in the U.S., um, that companies can be motivated to speak up on issues that don't directly affect their core business mm -hmm. when their employees make clear that they care yeah. and when students make clear that they care. So we yeah. are working to arm employees with information about here are the kinds of policies that your company should be supporting. And, yeah. and a lot of people, when you raise the issue of policy, they say, we need a price on carbon. And they are absolutely yeah. right. That is not yeah. the only policy. 
And politically, it might not even be the first one because the price on carbon can be actually politically very hard to get yeah. passed. Yeah. But clean, clean energy standards, clean building standards, clean vehicle standards, yeah. um, uh, subsidies for early stage technologies that help them get to scale so they can, yeah. can you know, drive them down that experience cost curve. Um, yeah. There are lots of policies like that that um, tend to be, in, you know, in the U.S. and other places, they tend to have bipartisan support. They yeah. actually can be more effective than a modest price on carbon in driving yeah. uh, rapid change. Um, and they're relatively cheap. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, in the next few weeks, we'll be releasing a policy guide for companies mm -hmm. There are lots of people out there working on policy. They know far more about policy than climate policy than, than I do, than yeah. people on my team do. Um, they have not translated that into um, something that people and companies, whether it's corporate executives or the public policy teams or grassroots employees who simply care about climate, something that they could, could internalize and understand yeah. that would help them say, you know, my company should be supporting the following policies yeah. everywhere it operates. Yeah. So that's, we're, okay. in, in a few weeks, we're gonna be releasing a guide that employees can use that to, to take to their executives that the public yeah. policy team can use. And so, okay. And that's gonna be on climatevoice.com or .org? .org, climatevoice.org. Climatevoice.org, and we'll put that in the URL with this on the yeah. uh, on the recording. And, and if people, you know, you asked about what could people do. So, you know, if if they are if they work for a company and they care about climate, they're really committed to climate. They want their company be, to be more committed. Well, when that policy guide comes out, they can take it to yeah. their executives if they're an executive to their peers and start yeah. saying, you know, we really need to actually step up. Yeah. Um, they can go to climatevoice.org and sign our pledge um, to add their voice so that we can go to companies and say, you know, we've yeah. got so many thousand people um, uh, who work in the field that you need to hire people in who care about this yeah. and who say it's going to matter in, in, in where they choose to work. Yeah. Um, and all of that together, I think, will help influence companies and, and move them. And create some additional pressure. And as I say, you know, access to that kind of information, the policy guide, doing the all in pledge on your website, I think is, um, is all hugely valuable to moving that forward and getting in at the grassroots because there's a generation of students and staff and, you know, people at the moment that really, that really see this as a clear and present issue and, and, and want to do something about it. They might not be currently in the C-suite, but they, they sure as hell are going to end up there and are going to influence the products that, that are sold and uh, manufactured. They can influence the C-suite today. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe not a single individual, but together, but and that's what we're yeah. trying to do, is give them the yeah. platform to help do, do that together. Yeah, and the raw information, and for me, that's 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 equally important. Having that really good data and being able to kind of almost audit what you're doing and figure out what are we doing that are the right things, what are we doing that maybe looks like the right thing, but you know maybe is. So yeah, challenges ahead, but I think it's um, it's it's exciting to have that stuff in place that that helps. Bill, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you. We'll. Uh, I'm sure we'll touch base again soon, but in the meantime, thanks to you and thanks well, thank to everybody you. for watching. Appreciate the opportunity.